yes, 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 yes. Yes. Oh my, oh my. Oh my, what a what a wonderful day. Stay as you are. Play softly. Stay as you are. What a wonderful day. Even when you don't think God is working, He's working. He's working it out behind the scenes because He's God. See, He's not like us. His promises are real. What He promised to us comes to pass. But do we make our commitment to Him to stay? See, that's the key for us because we're earthly people. He's in the kingdom. He sees everything. He knows all because he's God. We're here. We have to make the commitment to him to do his will, to do his work. The church, the church is removing himself because people are more consumed with worldly things. The news, success, things. God's calling his people back. God's calling men back to the church. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek, seek after him and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will heal their land. See, he's the healer of all things. Even when you don't see him working, he's working it out. He's already worked it out. See, it's a matter of do I commit to him, do I surrender, and do I say yes, and do I say I will do your will. Some of you today need to come back home. Some of you need to taste and see that the Lord is good. This is not Burger King you can have it your way. He's God. He's God Almighty. Jesus hung on the cross at Calvary, shed in his blood for sinners like us that we may have life and may have it more abundantly. If something great comes from Jesus when you enter in with Jesus, he's not like us. Jesus is a man with no sin in him. He's sinless. He's all power. And when you decide to surrender your life to him, he's going to do something great. Some of you today need to hear this message that God has for you. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We honor you. We praise you. First of all, we rebuke the devourer right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the body of Christ, Father. Let this not just be another day where some just show up because they thought they were coming to hear a baseball story. There's no baseball story. There's a rescue, redeem, the restored story. They need to understand that you are Lord. They need to understand that there is nobody like you. Only you can do a transformation in a man's woman's life. Man can't do it himself. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Father, we send this petition up to you right now. Father, we ask that you can seal it right now in the name of Jesus. And the church says, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you to the worship team. Give the worship team a... Oh my, oh my. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. It's very powerful when you have a worship team that leads you right into the presence of the Lord. And I'm just like ready to take off, you know, because, you know, the presence of the Lord is where we all need to be, not just on Sunday, but every day. Worship should be every day for all of us. Not just one day Sunday we come to church and then we worship God and thank God and for Sunday and then the rest of the week we, we don't even pick up our Bible. We don't even know uh, what we're talking about. You know, and that's where we have come in a society. We don't really understand who Jesus is because we're not reading our Bible and we're not committed to his perfect plan that he has for our life. Because he has a perfect plan. You know, he, he, it's, not us that, it, it's not us that qualify ourselves. God, God call, calls the unqualified, and he, he qualifies to call himself. See, because I wasn't always like this. <laughs> See, I was a liar, cheater, womanizer. I was an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. I was a sinner. I was privileged my whole life to live behind community gates, but I was saved by grace. <laughs> by grace. The only thing that can save a man is God's grace. 
You can't save yourself. No program can save you. Only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus, Jesus is the only one that will be able to rescue you, redeem you, and restore you. Pastor Chris, thank you for having me here as a guest. I appreciate it. It's so good to see you and be with your church. And you have a wonderful church. And this community, you need to understand this is the place you need to be. Is don't just show up because Daryl Strawberry here. <laughs> you know, Jesus is here every Sunday. I don't know what I don't know what you've been looking for, but did you hear the worship? <laughs> Jesus is here every Sunday. You need to be here. You need to be here and find out who you are in Christ and what God's called you to do for his kingdom. Because see, we're seeking after all these wrong kingdoms instead of the kingdom of God. Thank you, Joe, my brother, for inviting me to your wonderful church and seeing your wonderful family again. I love you guys. Yeah. And it's what the body of Christ is about, people loving people. You know, we've gotten away from that. You know, our society is consumed with confusion and, and everybody's fighting and bicker over all this foolishness down here when we need to be entering into the kingdom of God and staying on course with God and not all these earthly things. You know, Second Chronicle, the Israelites, they could have been in the promised land. After 400 years of slavery, they could have been in the promised land in 11 days. They complained so much, God let them... Let, let them stay in the wilderness for another 40 years. I do know one thing about God. God will leave you right where you're at if you won't obey him. Yes. I'm a living witness because I was that person. Rich, famous, home runs, trophies, and everything. But I was broken, empty. My father was an alcoholic, beat me, said I never mounted none. Came home for the last time when I was 14, pulled out a shotgun, said he was going to kill the whole family. See, I was already scarred before I ever put the uniform on. Most people don't know what happened to people. They don't realize. We, don't, we, we just think, well, why shouldn't he be well? Because he's making money. Money does not make you well. Amen. Fame does not make you well. It just makes that people notice you even more. God spoke to me when Kobe Bryant died. God said, that could be anybody. Kobe went to Mass that Sunday morning, got on the helicopter, he never came back home. That could be any one of us. What are you doing? God said, you could be on a flight. Told me, because I fly all the time, 250 times traveling, ministering, preaching the gospel. He said, that could be you. But I do know one thing, your heart is right with me. Do you have your heart right? Because tragedy can happen, death's gonna happen. But is your heart right with God? Is a man in his rightful place doing what God called him to do? I never know what message I'm gonna preach because preach, I'm not gonna preach it because the Holy Spirit always gives it to me sometime when I'm just in worship. I always prepare, but he always gives me something different. So I know it's not me. So I don't have to worry about it and depend on preaching because I'm not the one to preach. The great one's going to preach through me. And he's supernatural. He's the Holy Spirit. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Trinity. They are one. We have gotten away from teaching our young people the gospel, the good news. See, the Bible talks about it. The Bible says my people perish because of lack of knowledge. See, we were, I was perishing because of lack of knowledge. I had fame and I had richness, but I had no knowledge until I started seeking after the kingdom. Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God is righteousness, then all these things will be added into you. See, there's something greater that God gives you than money, than fame. It's the dwelling of the Holy Spirit that comes in you, and he teaches you all things about the Bible. See, nine years ago, God called me to preach. I didn't want to preach. I said, you got the wrong guy, Pastor. <laughs> I had a restaurant business, and my wife had been praying, God, knock him off his throne. She prayed just like my mother, God, knock him off his throne. <laughs> and guess what? God knocked me off my throne. And some of you that are here today, you should be glad that God brought you here, because some of us shouldn't be here. There's things in our lives that we think we're getting away with, but we don't get away with it. God sees it all. Aren't we glad he just don't judge us on it right now? 
I'm glad he didn't judge me when I was living in sin. I'm still a sinner. I just don't practice anymore. <laughs> Glory to God. That's what it is. You just don't practice anymore. Now, because you've been redeemed, you know, you understand and you wonder how can people like, live like that and how can they say they live so holy and righteous? Well, because we've gotten into a relationship with Jesus himself. See, when you give Jesus your heart and get into the relationship with Jesus, you don't need anything else. Right. You, you're missing it. You don't need anything else. When you get to a relationship with Jesus, and Jesus is Lord over your life, you need nothing. You have everything that's been missing. See, the emptiness on the inside of all of us that's, that we try to fill with so many things, um, drugs, sex, uh, money, uh, stuff, more this, more that, we try to fill, we try to fill this empty void on the inside. King Solomon was the one who had everything, but at the end of the day, he said it all is meaningless. He's seeing life under the sun, King Solomon the son of David. And he's telling us in the book of Ecclesiastes that it all means nothing. There's an emptiness and an empty void on the inside of man that only God can fill. Nobody else can fill it but God himself. We could try it with everything else and we try, to, we try to fill it with everything else, but it never works. It will never work. So church, I'm here today to tell you, when you're facing storms in life, guess what? How is this part of life? Yeah, when we're facing storms, because when things happen, this is the title today, when things happen, Johnny was asking me what I'm preaching today, I don't know, Holy Spirit. <laughs> I said the Holy Spirit tell me once I get in worship. But I'm preaching about when things happen, when things happen to all of us, because they will. And it's the reality of how do we deal with it when things happen? Who do we turn to? Who do we trust? Who do we look for when things happen? Because they come and storms are coming. Either you're in a storm or a storm on the way, or are you coming out of a storm? It's the reality of this life that we live. And it never stops. The storms never stop. They just come and they go. But what do we do? I love this text. When things happen, the title when facing storms in our life, what do you do? Who do you trust? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. But you don't you See, most people, the problem with us as Christians, pastor, folks don't even know scriptures. See, y'all don't realize there's power in the scriptures. That's where the power lies in, in the scriptures. It doesn't lie in a man's mouth, a man's education, how well he sounds. I'm not educated. I'm not qualified to preach, but the Holy Spirit is. Because, see, he's supernatural. He's supernatural to teach me all things and remember. It's like Jesus said he would. He, he's supernatural. He teaches me scriptures, and he put them down in my belly. And he leaves them down there because I asked him to. I asked him to teach me scriptures and retain them and tell me what they mean. See, so many of us don't even have a book. We don't even pick up the book. But I want the revelation, but I won't pick up the book. The revelation is in the book. It's always been here. 2,000 years ago when Jesus was walking the earth and preaching, he's, he's, he's the same God today that he was back then. Different group of people, different set of people. See, they didn't have homes and cars and all the stuff we have. Luxury places to go and food to eat. They didn't live in mansions, not the believers. They was always being persecuted by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Just like we are today as Christians, persecuted by the world. But that's okay, I'm glad. See, because they were talking about me when I was a heathen, now they're talking about me because I love Jesus. <laughs> So I tell you one thing, church, just, just get over it because they're going to talk about you anyway. <laughs> but that's the real reality. But one thing I do know is walking with Jesus, I don't have to look back. 
You know, most people come and think I'm, you know, this baseball player. I'm no longer him. He's dead. I've been transformed by God himself. Romans 12, 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. This is what renewed my mind. This book right here. And guess what? It's free. <laughs> we want everything else to make us feel well and fix us, make me this and make me that. And this book here has been putting people back together forever. And that's what you're looking at here. I'm not living in the past, even when the storms come. What do I do? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Didn't say trust in your, your job, your, your bank account. He said, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Not some of it, all of it. See, we got to get there. I, I, I can't get there trusting the Lord with all my heart if I'm still holding on to the past, Pastor. Just what you talked about. Some people coming in here with past stuff, past, past hurt, and, and, and never letting go of them. And still got the past holding them back. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, you can never get to the new if you don't get rid of the past. See, if I was holding on to the baseball trophies and I'm Daryl Strawberry, eight-time All-Star, four-time World Series, I could never get to what God had in front for me. You could never get there if you don't get over the old. See, God's got something new every day for us that participate in his plan and not our plan. See, God looking for people that are willing to participate in his plan. Because, see, most of us sitting here, we, we're consumed of talking about earthly stuff, and he's telling us to seek after my kingdom. My kingdom is great. There's something great comes out of my kingdom. When you look at Solomon, he was great, and, and he had, the, right in the book of Proverbs, he, wisdom and knowledge, great revelation that he gave. But he didn't stay the course, and he went on his own course. The first three, first three chapters in Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon says, I, himself, I, 46 times, instead of saying God. I built this. I did this. I saw this. I, I, I. That's what we do. I, instead of saying God, your will, not mine. Your way, not my way. May I be a servant to you. May I build your kingdom. May I build your church. See, we, we want to build everything else, but we don't want to build a church. Oh, we got it so wrong down here. <laughs> we got it so wrong. God's calling us to build, build a church. Men, God's calling you back. Where are you? You're consumed with all these earthly things. He's calling you back so he can give you the revelation, so he can download his information inside of you, so you can be able to do the great kingdom work and win souls. See, we're in an epidemic today because we separate. Lawlessness brings about brokenness. We're in an epidemic today with all our kids using drugs and opiates and dying and killing themselves because the enemy's having a field day. He's laughing at the people down here. And God said, where are my men? Where are my soldiers for the kingdom? Oh, we too busy watching a football game on Sunday instead of being in church. I can tell you what's going to happen. Somebody going to win, somebody going to lose. <laughs> That's all that's going to happen. <laughs> but when you miss church, you miss a revelation. Yes. Yes. You miss a revelation from God when you're missing church. When you're not participating in this and you're sitting and waiting for the game and, and thinking about this, well, my team coming on. You're missing God's great revelation for you. Because see, when we come to church and we commit to church, God speaks to us. Because that's the only way he can, he can get you if you come in and, and you, you make yourself consistently come into church. Now he will speak to your heart and he will bring about his revelation to who you are. You'll never know him if you don't come. That's the problem I was when I was lost and straddling the fence and being a hypocrite. 
<laughs> right on the fence. Oh, it's Jesus. I didn't. I just knew his name, but I didn't know his power. I was there before too, straddle on the fence. But when I came all the way in, I understand how great he is. Because there's nobody greater. Because most of us don't even know him. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised for your iniquity. By his stripes, you get to be healed. See, by his stripes of what he did on the cross, where the scribes and the Pharisees didn't know who he was, and he was hanging on the cross at Calvary, and he said, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then he says, Father, why have you forsaken me, leaving him hanging up on the cross? And his last words was on the cross was, it is finished. Everything that could kill us, Jesus already killed it. All right, we sit around here worry about we sit around sit around here worry about these earthly problems and getting consumed with it. And Jesus already killed it because see he went to the tomb and then early Sunday morning he got up from the tomb and when he got up from the tomb he got up with all power because he was resurrected. See Galatians two twenty talks about it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me. See when you die you will be resurrected just like Jesus, but you got to die. <laughs> You got to die. The old fleshy you got to die. Must die. Because if you don't die, then you can never, you can never enter in. See, if I didn't die, I could never enter in and, and get all this revelation and down, download inside of me. Because this revelation comes from God free, but he needs a temple that has, he's dead. Now he can pour his spirit in there. Now he can use you to glorify his kingdom. And win souls because at the end of the day it's about winning souls see we even got away from what what's really important it's all about winning souls. see Billy Graham was the greatest soul winner we will ever see everybody else is probably you know coming you know to a place you know most popular pastor it's about them and their brand there's no brand greater than Jesus yes. I don't have a brand Jesus is my brand amen, <laughs> amen. amen. When facing storms, the reality of life that we all live in, and facing storms. But see, if we sit here, if I, if I would have sat here and played a victim because of what happened to me, ended up in addiction, shooting dope, smoking crack, ended up with a T-17169 Florida State Prison for addiction, and ended up $3 million in debt and didn't have a driver's license when God called me. I said, God, you got a great sense of humor. <laughs> See, the thing about it, God wasn't concerned about me having stuff. He was concerned about me being well. Had cancer twice, lost my left kidney. If you've never seen a miracle, you're looking at one because Jesus is the miracle maker. He takes a mess and brings it into a message. That's what he does. So had I sat there and played the victim role of what some of us do in society, then I could never step into the place that God wants me to be in. I'm not a victim. I'm overcome by the blood of the Lamb. See, when you understand his blood, when you understand his blood on that cross, oh, hallelujah. When you understand that blood on that cross, that blood is clean. So that blood comes into you and it purifies you, liberates you, redeems you, brings you wholeness and righteousness, and you no longer live from a worldly standpoint. You live from a kingdom standpoint. You live from a biblical standpoint. See, no man can do that. Only the blood of Jesus can do that to you. See, we've been searching for all these other things to fix me, fix me, make me well. It hadn't made you well. You can go to whatever course you want to go to. It's not until you fall at the altar and fall on your face to God and tell God, I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. He's the savior. He's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that can restore you back to wholeness in your rightful place with him.
No man, no other anything else can do it but God himself. And you know what I love about him? Is he's such a merciful God. But I need to trust him with all my heart. Then in the second part of that text, I need to lean not on your own understanding. So many of us lean on our own understanding. Oh, I got this. I used to tell my wife, I got this. She's like, okay. <laughs> okay, keep, keep, keep wearing the uniform, Daryl Strawberry. She said, when are you going to take the uniform off? When are you going to take the baseball uniform off and not be Daryl Strawberry anymore and be the man of God he's called you to be? When are you going to saturate yourself and lock yourself up in the room with God and cry to God and tell God to help you? Because you can't help yourself. So that's what I did. I locked myself in the room and I cried to God and said, God, please help me. I need you. And you know what God says to me one day? I took the Bible out and I put it on the bed. He said, don't open that Bible. He said, I've been waiting for you. Some of you today, he's been waiting for you. What are you doing? When are you going to make a decision? Life is short. It could be over like that. And you hadn't made that decision. And you're still living in the old kind of way. I remember me and Tracy, when we were together, when we first got together, boyfriend and girlfriend, she woke up one morning and looked at me. She said, I'm not doing this no more. I said, what you mean? She said, I'm not living like this no more. I said, okay, we're boyfriend and girlfriend shacking up. She said, I ain't having sex with you no more. I said, what? <laughs> she said, I'm going to follow Jesus. Go look at our webpage today, findingyourway.com, and see her. She's very powerful. She followed Jesus. She was an example to me of what Jesus really looked like. And God released, God made me go away, and I went away for six months. Then he sent me back to marry her, and we got on a real life with God. Started with $3 million in debt and no driver's license. And God restored us, multiplied us, increased us, and gave me more than $3 million I was in debt. Because he's God. See, when we do it right, and we stop playing church, me and her stopped playing church. She made, me, she made me go find God, Pastor. A woman. Oh, how much power a woman can have in her hand. <laughs> how they can straighten you out and make you say, you know, because she, she made the commitment. She was like, I'm going to follow God. She said, I don't know what you're doing. I'm going to follow God. My wife today, her name is Dr. Tracy Strawberry. And she got a master's in ministry, too. And she's a doctor. Because she followed the biblical principles. And that's what God is telling us to lean not on our own understanding. We, we, we lean on our own understanding instead of the understanding of him and his word. And, we, and we, we look at everything from what we see from an earthly standpoint, but we don't see from a kingdom standpoint. You know, it's like I saw everything from an earthly standpoint when I was winning championships and hitting, and I used to always wonder after I took off that uniform, who am I? Just don't want to be a baseball player. My kids, they never seen my life in such a mess when I was, because they were young, they didn't know. People goes, oh, your, people tell them, I'll say, oh, your dad's a great baseball player. He goes, oh, no, my dad's a preacher. <laughs> That's God himself. <laughs> Here it is. I'm leaving a different legacy for my kids. As a man, the legacy I'm, leave, I'm leaving for my kids, that Jesus is Lord. Because you know what happened? My mother left a legacy to me that Jesus was Lord. Not me, not the trophies, not the fame, that Jesus was Lord. My mother was dying, and I was a heathen, and she was praying for all of us. When she was dying, we found a journal under her bed, and she was like praying, Lord, save my kids. Do whatever you have to do with them. I don't care. Knock them off the throne. Pray. And she kept praying. So, Mama, some of you, Mama's praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. I, my, mother, my mother didn't get to see 
me in the natural, but she's watching me in the supernatural. She's laughing. She's laughing because she told me one day, she said, boy, I prayed for her. She said, hmm, you can pray. She said, God just spoke to me. God said he's going to get it out of you. <laughs> Mama don't lie. <laughs> That's the real reality of it. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Well, what I really have to say is God really have a great road for you, but you got to commit. You got to commit to the body of Christ. You got to commit to the church. The church is awesome when you commit to it. See, so many of us stand on the outside and we're not committed. Well, I don't want to go to church because I don't like this song. It's, it's not about you. Yes. Get over yourself. <laughs> That ego that the man has is a three-letter word, ego. Easing God out. That's what ego means, easing God out. When you come and give God your heart for real and become a part of church and say, yes, it's a three-letter word, too. Why, yes, you enjoy salvation. Salvation is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Does no, nothing taste like the Lord. Salvation is free. It's those that enter in, those that give themselves away, those that die to their flesh and let their flesh die. Saturate yourself with God in his word and he has something great for, for you. I never went to school. God called me out of a pit and put me in a pulpit. You can't tell me God's not a bad dude. He found me in a pit, pastor, the pit of life. And he pulled me out of the pit while everybody else was laughing. He said, oh, I like you. I'm going to use you. I'm going to clean you up, and I'm going to use you for my glory. See, when we understand the Bible, when we understand the Bible clearly and get to the revelation of the Bible, and we understand that everybody in here that he called, they all had issues. Moses, he called him to lead the Israelites out of bondage, 400 years of slavery. Moses had a speech impediment and killed the Egyptian. God used him mightily because of Moses' meekness. Peter denied Christ three times. He, he had them crucify him upside down because he was so ashamed. He denied Christ three times. Jonah, God told him to go to Nineveh to preach the gospel. He jumped on a boat to go the other way. God throws him in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. God always got a plan. <laughs> Jonah gets spits out, and Jonah's all, you got to remember, these are all Jewish people. And they're the favorite and the chosen people of God. Jonah gets out, spit, spit out of the belly with the fish. And he was so mad at God. <laughs> you know, why would you say them in that city? Acting like a bunch of pagans, Gentiles, us. And God made it clear to Jonah, from this day forward, my grace is for all. Not just you, Jonah, but for all. But for all who want it, my grace is for you. So when do we decide we want the grace? When do we accept it? I think about Saul on his, on his way to Damascus. And, you know, Saul was a bad dude, well-educated dude, but bad, persecuting, killing Christians. God knocks him off a horse and blinds him for three days and three nights. Saul wasn't a hero at that time. A man by the name of Ananias was the hero that God gave the vision to, to go see Saul, to lay hands on Saul, so Saul would get his sight. Then he would become the apostle Paul. And he goes on to write 13 epistles, which is letters. This, this God I'm talking about, he's amazing. He meets us right where we're at, but it's the commitment that a man has to make from his heart. Don't overanalyze it and think you got it all together, figured out, because you don't. Because he has it all figured out, because guess what? He created you. He know every, every mistake you're going to make and every trial and tribulation that's going to be a part of you. He created you. Some of you getting too old. 
playing around, there's a birth date and there's a death date. Some of you getting too old to be still stuck. When are you going to surrender for real? When are you going to stop playing? God yourself. When are you going to build the kingdom? You live in this community. It's your church. When are you going to start giving help and hands saying, you know what, Lord, we need to build a church and we need to build it bigger to reach more people in this community? When, when, when? What are you doing? Sitting around twirling your fingers. God saying, what about you? What are you waiting for? When are you going to commit? You looking at your wife? Because she's going to church all the time. When are you going to commit? You looking at your husband? Because he's going to church all the time. When, when are you going to commit? When is the church and the people and the community going to rise up and realize the power is in the church? It's not, into, it's not in the political people. It's in the church. It's when the church step up and we become the church, now we win the whole community because we are the church. God's calling some of you today to make a new commitment. He's calling some of you to come back home. He's calling some of you that never heard the gospel. Yeah, you thought, man, Daryl Strawberry, baseball player. Yeah, but I'm a gospel preacher now. I've been touched by God, not by man, but by God himself. And it's free. Oh, is it good? Oh, what a privilege it is to be touched by God. It's the greatest job I've ever had. It's not the success. It's not the trophies. It's Jesus. He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the great I am. When are you going to make that decision? Some of you today. God's speaking to your heart to make a decision. And as we close, as I close, get down to closing. I had a little water spill here, but. Let me test you, Joe. Thank you. As I get down to the last five minutes here, thank you, sir. As I wind this down, I love God. I love his people. Pastor, I love you. You're a brother in Christ. You're strong. God's called you for this community, this church, you and your family. Your wife is beautiful. I met her today, and she's just full of joy of the Lord. I love people that's like that because that's me, and that should be all of us. When are some of us going to really make that commitment that that's going to be me? I'm going to be a, a, a lover of Christ who follows the biblical principles, who loves people and help people from a different perspective. Not from an earthly perspective, saying, look at me what I have. Jesus got the whole kingdom. We got all this junk down here. He's got a whole kingdom with mansions and everything else that's lacking and missing in us. Revelation of the word. But you're going to be tested when you make a commitment. Who are you going to be tested? See, I didn't get like this overnight. See, when God called me, when God called me, he sat me for seven years because if I wasn't equipped, he knew the devil would kill me. So he's got to equip you. You got to go through discipleship so you can know that you know that you know that you know 
Because the devil is no joke. Jesus said it in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. He's telling you that the enemy is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Keep you separated from God. But the abundant life he's talking about giving you, he's talking about giving you peace, joy, wisdom, knowledge. He's far greater than anything that you can ever imagine. Far greater than anything that you can ever imagine. See, the book of John, the book of John is about believing. Glory to God. The book of John is about believing. Jesus was doing the miracles back then. He's doing them today. The feeding of the 5,000, raising Lazarus from the dead. But John 3, he told Nicodemus in less one. Nicodemus was a Pharisee teacher, leader. He told him in less one, enter the kingdom of heaven. He cannot be born again. See, we've all been born of a natural birth from our parents that God seed. But he's talking about the second birth, which is supernatural. This is spiritual birth, born of the Spirit. Revelation of the Spirit of God. John 4, there's no secrets to God. Some of us think, well, you know, God don't know anything about me. <laughs> he knows everything. Sees everything. Sees whatever chat line, computer, whatever in your thoughts and you're going through, he sees it all. Because he's God. John 4, the woman at the well, he, this woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, he told her she was there, and he told her about her five husbands and said, the one you're living with now is not your husband. And he said, by the way, you keep drinking from that water, you're going to always be thirsty. But he said, if you drink this living water, who I am, you'll never, never thirst again. Ever since I've been drinking this living water, I have never been thirsty again. Yeah. There's something great about living water. There's something great about living water. There's something great about the living water, the Word of God. It's living water. You never thirst again. John 8, don't be like the scribes, Sadducees, and the Pharisees pointing at a woman and her sin called in adultery because when you point at somebody else, three fingers point right back at you. <laughs> I love that when God told me that. Look, you pointing at somebody else, look at them. Oh, but three point right back. Oh. And that's what they wanted to stone the woman because of the law of Moses. And Jesus was kind of hanging out, writing down in the sand and raised up. He said, he who without sin cast the first stone. From the oldest to the youngest dropped the stones because they all had fallen short and had sin. Then he went back down and rose up to the woman and says, woman, where are your accusers? Has anyone accused you? She said, no. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus is a bad dude. <laughs> he rocks. He doesn't condemn you. He doesn't judge you. Because if he judged us, we all would be dead. Yes. He knows that we're going to all fall short. It didn't say some will fall short. The Bible said we all will fall short. For the wages of sin, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. John 5 is the last one. John 5 is about a bunch of lame people at a pool called Bethesda. I remember going to Israel six, and spending 16 days there and I went by this pool of Bethesda. And there was a bunch of lame people there and the angels would stir up the pool and the first one to get in today, lame people like us, sick, crippled, whatever it may be, illness. And he would, the angel would stir up the pool, the first one would get in there, would be made well immediately. But this one particular man sat there. He sat there for 38 years. How long have you been sitting? He sat there for 38 years in a condition. He was paralyzed. Guess what? Jesus didn't ask the man about his condition because guess what? Jesus already knew the man's condition. He asked the man one thing. He said, do you want to be made well? And the man said, sir, every time I try to get him, stop the excuses. And the man finally said, yes. You know what he told that man? Pick up your bed and walk. Today, God's calling somebody to pick up the bed and walk. God want to make you well. That's you today, right where you at. Everybody with their eyes closed. Some of you need to make a commitment today, and it's not about people and thinking. Some of you need to make a commitment in your heart to God today. If that's you, right where you at, just stand up. I want to pray for you. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. That's you. You know you need to make a commitment to God. 
There you go. Make a commitment to him. He's a good God. He's a good God. He's a good God. He's a righteous God. Make your commitment. There you go. Make your commitment to him. God, I'm going I'm to do it. I'm going to make a commitment to you. Some of you need to ask for forgiveness. Some of you need to forgive somebody else too. Somebody needs to ask for forgiveness to somebody else. My father rejected me, beat me, but I was ended up forgiving him. And guess what? God healed me. And I ended up leading the man to the Lord that beat me, that rejected me. See, because the forgiveness was not for him, it was for me. There's some more in you here. There's some men in here that's struggling. You're not in your rightful place. Stand up. God wants to touch your heart. Let him touch your heart. Amen, brother. That's it. Let him touch your heart. Let God touch your heart, man. Man can't fix you. Stuff can't fix you. Only God can do it himself. There you go. Let him touch your heart. He's a righteous, forgiving, loving God. Look what he has done to my life. He has, take, he has transformed my life and touched me and brought me to wholeness and righteousness because I made a commitment. Some of you need to repent for something. Right where you at, stand up. Repent, God will forgive you right now. Don't miss the moment. There you go, he'll forgive you right now. Repent, Re just, re just, re just repent. That's all it is, it's no big thing, repent. He's a forgiving God. That's all it is. He forgives you right now, let it be. He's not holding you accountable, he's not, he's not mad at you. Just let it go. That's all he says. Bring it. Bring it to me and let it go. I will forgive you. Some of you need a miracle right now. You need to stand up. You need a miracle from God. Right now. Right now. Right now. God's going to give you a miracle. Right now. The miracle maker. He's the miracle maker. He's a wonderful God. He's a miracle maker. He's, he heals the heart. He heals everything. He's the miracle God. There you go. Let it go, church. Let it go. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord had made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. I'm not holding it back from nothing else. I'm not worried about what anybody else thinks. God, it's you. It's you. It's you. It's you, God. Yes. He loves his people. Those that are willing to stand up, he loves you. Those of you that's not willing to stand up, he loves you also. But those that stand up publicly for him, that's a declaration to the Lord. And you know what he takes that? God takes that to heart. Man doesn't take it to heart, but God takes it to heart. Because he's the God of the heart. Right now. Father, all over this place, you see him, Father. Father, I lift him up to you right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you have spoken to their heart, that you have touched them in a way that no one else can touch them. Do what only you can do with their situation, Father. Father, may they lean on you, not their own understanding. Some has made a commitment, some has made ask for forgiveness. Some need to know that you're Savior and that you're Lord. And as they continue to stay, I ask Pastor to come up right now so he can minister to the hearts of his people. And the, your promises over their life, Father, and the victory that you give them. The victory that you give us, Father, no one can give us, only you can give us. The incredible victory of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, bless your people. Keep them, protect them. A new day for them, a new season. In Jesus' name, Pastor Chris. Thank you, Daryl. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. God's worthy, amen. God's worthy. Would you all stand with me? Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Let's all stand and give God praise because he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Those of you who stood today said, I need repentance. Guess what? You got it. Those of you who stood today and said, I need a miracle today, guess what? That didn't fall on deaf ears. That fell on the way maker today. He'll make a way in your desert. God's doing a great thing in some of your lives. I want to tell you, man, if you don't have a, if you don't have a church, get into a good Bible preaching church. I happen to know of one. <laughs> Love to have you with us. Daryl, thank you so much for that great word today, man. God bless you.
God bless you. <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to close us out in prayer in just a second, but I have a little bit of housekeeping I need you to help me with. Um, there's a lot of us here. The parking lot is very, very full, and uh, and we got another service coming in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask that uh, we're going we're gonna pray. And some of you want uh, pictures and autographs, and we certainly understand that. Uh, Daryl's going to be over here. He's over to my left. And uh, if you want to do that, there's there's uh, uh, Joe and Big Joe and, and Pastor Kyle over there. They're going to kind of help with all of that. And, and uh, so please just work with us and uh, to keep that orderly. And uh, but otherwise, we're going to dismiss you just to go right out through the the main uh, the main uh, exit and entrance here. Um, God is so good. Amen. Listen, this is the start. This, the yes, the yes is the start, but God has got a life. Daryl Strawberry is a man transformed. He is a man that the enemy tried to claw to hell and God reached in in the midst of his hell and pulled him out and put him on another platform so that he could use what the enemy intended for evil. God has turned around for the good, amen? But he does the same thing for every one of us. Every one of us. And here's the cool thing. That he, when, when we receive Christ as Savior, the Bible says that even though no, every man sins, everyone falls short of the glory of God, God no longer sees you as a sinner. But he sees you as righteous. That can only happen because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That only happens because Jesus did defeat death, hell, and the grave. And because he made a way where there was no way. So that yes today, it means something. And when you leave these doors today, every pain, every heartache, every worry, every stress, you don't need to take that with you. You leave here with the joy of the Lord and a peace that passes your understanding and a hope that is secure. Amen? Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for you and then, and then you can consider yourself uh, dismissed. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the joy that is in this house. Thank you, God, for your love and your mercy and your grace and your peace. Lord, I pray, God, that every person that was bold enough to stand up today, I pray, Father, that your grace would rest upon them in such a tangible and real way. I pray, Father, that they don't leave here, Father, uh, with, with any doubt in their mind, but, God, they leave here uh, a new person, clean and refreshed in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you, Lord, that you would do great things even this week, Father, and continue to deepen them, Lord. And as we go throughout this week, let us walk under your anointing and come back rejoicing together next week. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.